Hi, I'm Valerie Koo, and today I'm talking to Kathy Lett. Now, Kathy Lett is a global publishing sensation. She shot to fame when she was just 16 at the release of the novel she co-wrote, Puberty Blues, which became an Australian classic. She's since written 15 best-selling novels and splits her time between Sydney and London and has become a columnist and media personality, as well as an acclaimed author. Her latest book is Till Death or a Little Light Maiming, Do Us Part. Thanks so much for joining us today, Kathy. It's a pleasure, treasure. <laughs> I'm Shire girls, darling. Well, exactly. I'm so thrilled to be speaking to you because my first exposure to you was when I was very, very young. Of course, at the time, Puberty Blues came out. You are the sole reason my parents refused to send me to Sylvania High. But, you know, <laughs> and I've watched your career tra trajectory all these years and I'm so excited about your latest book, Oh, till death you. or a little light maiming do us part what a romp what a what a thoroughly enjoyable read oh, now you. for listeners and readers who haven't got their um, hands on a copy yet and they should can you tell us what it's about well it starts with uh, Gwen who's a 60 year old school teacher and she's driving to work and she hears on the radio that a man's been taken by a great white shark and it's where her husband swims every day so she panics, screams down to the beach, jumps out of the car, and just as she's realising that, yes, it is her husband who's missing and her grief is kicking in, another woman turns up, 50-year-old Tish, on a motorbike, a jazz singer, and she thinks it's her husband. So the two women very quickly realise that they're married to a bigamist and he's disappeared along with all of their money. Mm. So it's an odd couple comedy where these two very different women get together to track their money down and they zoom around the world on this incredible quest. And the reason I, I wrote this book is, first of all, I wanted to write something really funny. Mm. I think two years of pandemic, you know, all the floods we've had in Australia, now root and toot and shoot and Putin with his finger on the nuclear trigger. Have we ever needed a laugh more? No, I don't think so. And I also wanted to take us on an adventure because we haven't been able to travel. So mm. I was in lockdown in London, desperately trying to get home to see my mum. And I'm a travel writer. I have a column in the, in the British papers called Adventure Before Dementia, can't pay the hell out of DM. And I have been to a lot of amazing places, but I suddenly I, I couldn't go anywhere. So I thought, well, I'll, I'll take my readers on a flight of fancy. I'll take them all around the world to these exotic locations while they're having a great adventure. Um, and I also wanted to celebrate female friendship because mm. you know, I do think women are each other's human wonder bras, uplifting, supportive, and making each other look bigger and better. <laughs> um, and, and the other element I wanted to address, because all my books, are my books, I hope they are funny. I try mm. and disarm with charm. But I also always have a feminist message. And the feminist message in this book is, is against ageism. I think women suffer from ageism in a way that men don't. We suffer from facial prejudice. We get judged on our looks. Um, and and we, don't, we don't necessarily judge men in the same way. Like a man my age is deemed to be a silver fox, <laughs> you know, a man of experience, where I'm dismissed as an old bag, an old hag, and an old chook. <laughs> and whenever I read books that have a woman my age as a protagonist, you know, like a, a Anita Brooklyn novel or whatever, she usually, you know, wilts away with loneliness, dies of despair in her flat and gets eaten by her cats. Now, <laughs> I don't know any women like that. My women friends are funny, feisty, fabulous, frank. You know, they're swinging off a chandelier with a toy boy between their teeth. <laughs> and, and they're the women I want to see on the page. Mm. And, you never, and they, you just don't see them. So yeah. I wanted to write these protagonists who were is smart, funny, clever, and, you know, having their beefcake and eating him too. <laughs> so I think the book, it, it, I wanted it to, I want to be the wind beneath women's bingo wings and say, go to <laughs> and be fabulous. So that's really what the book's about. <laughs> I absolutely loved it. And I could, I was watching it unfold in my mind. I was, I had already cast the characters. So if you want any, you know, tips, just, just ask me. And, uh, and it does go to all of these 
fantastic locations and 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 countries and um it's just such a enjoyable ride and you know devoured it now when you decided okay you obviously thought as you just said that you wanted to write this book about these two protagonists and female friendship and all of that but it goes on this really interesting sleuthing journey what did you have to do to plan that out and determine all the little episodes and escapades that they were going to go through? And and importantly, did you know what was going to happen at the end? Oh, yeah. At the start? I don't, I don't want to give away too much because there's some... No, of course not. There's some fantastic twists and turns and yes. unexpected things happen. Um, but I did know that I wanted it by the end of the book for these two very different women who really don't like each other in the beginning. And don't trust each other. They're just thrown together because they're worried that the other one will take if she finds the money, she'll keep it. <laughs> I wanted them to discover strengths in each other and learn something from each other and create an, an unlikely friendship. Because yeah, I mm. think women do, we do bond so quickly because we've got, you know, we've got so much in common, like starting with being the butt of God's biological joke. You know, I think of all <laughs> the things women go through but when you first get taken hostage by your hormones once a month as a teenager, mm. and then there's pregnancy where everything swells to sumo wrestler proportions, mm. and then there's childbirth where you stretch a birth canal the customary, what, five, six kilometres? <laughs> then, there's then there's the menopause, and then just when everything goes quiet, you know, you grow a beard, which is what's happening <laughs> to me now, make a macrame hanging basket <laughs> in here. Why? So I think, you know, women, I think we cut to the chase quickly with each other because we do have these profoundly shared experiences. And um, anthropologists back me up that women um, are funny. I always say that, you know, women have, when you go on a girl's night out, you have to be hospitalised from hilarity. Um, And if I have any strength at all as a writer, I think it's putting into words what women are thinking but not necessarily saying out loud. Mm. And also writing down the way women talk when there's no men around. And, um, and, you know, women are funny. I mean, but that's how we survive when we're together, laughing. It's like strapping a giant shock absorber to your brain. And what I was going to say about anthropologists backing me up, they maintain that women in all cultures on the planet laugh more often than men, especially in an all-female group, which I think is really, really interesting. So that's, that's what I try and capture on the page. But because there was a lot of sleuthing in the book to be mm. done, I have got, um, I've got a friend, two friends who are private detectives. So I did check everything with them and, and find out how, how this, how the two women could do all this, uh, make their way through the financial maze. And I also gave Gwen, my, the main character, an autistic son who's very good at cyber, you know, cyber sleuthing. So, and because my son's autistic, you know, that came naturally to me to write a character like that. And he and Gwen and her son Max do actually, they, they've never really understood each other because, you know, autistic people have no social skills, very small social skills. Mm. And they're not often not that good at emoting and empathizing. And they've never really had found their, their common ground. But during, at, through the book, of course, they help because he helps her mm. they, they kind of build a new friendship which is also a nice little thing a little bit of that's a little bit of garlic I added into the mm. <clears throat> so when you are about to write a novel and let's just take this one, this one as an example because it's the one that most recently happened do you do you have this idea and start writing or do you let it marinate for months so like some people and and then in the writing process is it full on like I know you have other commitments responsibilities of course but is it your your key focus that you do from when you wake up till the end of the workday it's my favorite thing to do out of all the all the other I do tv presenting and I write I do I've got columns in newspapers and I go travel writing and all that but writing novels is my favorite thing it's what I've always done it's cheaper Mm. than therapy (laughs) (laughs) and I also um I wait to see what's annoying me, like what's bubbling up inside me, and I get ahead of steam about that. And then I just have, then ideas just come to me about how I could, uh, you know, how I could best um, illustrate my angst, (laughs) how I could best exercise my angst and illustrate it in a narrative drive. And John Mortimer once said something great to me. He wrote the Rumpole series. I don't know if you remember. He said, as long as you've got your first line and your last line, so you know where you're going, 
you can mm. set up on your journey. But I do plan. I do plan my books quite carefully because I've got a lot, I always have a lot of twists and you've got to plant those things early. So when they pay off later, the reader goes, oh, right, because she said that in that chapter. You can't, you know, leave any narrative stone unturned. Mm. So I do plan quite carefully and I do a lot of drafts. But sometimes a book just writes itself. When I wrote mm. um, The Boy Who Fell to Earth, which is a very autobiographical novel about a single mother raising a child on the autistic spectrum, I wasn't expecting to write that book. I was going to write another book about the sex war, which is my, you know, my usual literary territory. But these other mm. books that are pouring out of my pen because it had been bubbling away in my brain for so long. Uh, and I just let that book flow and I didn't mm. really know where that was going. And that was quite a fun experience. But I suppose I've been subconsciously writing it for a decade. You know? mm. So, yeah, but I think planning is important. But then again, you know, let it, if your characters want to need to go a different way because you discover more about them as you're writing them, of course, mm. you know, don't be afraid to detour. <laughs> yeah. So when you say you do plan, what does that look like? Do you... Just plan it in your head? Do you have index cards? Do you just write it in a Word document? How do you actually plan? I have a whiteboard. Oh. And I do part, because most narrative structures are in three acts. Yes. So I, I have act one, act two, act three, and then I break the chapters down. I mean, I'm quite methodical. And I write the narrative up, just just point, like head chapter headings about where the momentum's going. And then I sit back and look at it and see if I'm repeating anything or if I can move the narrative faster anywhere. So I do I do plan it um, most of the time. Yes. And it really helps because when you're in the middle of a novel, you can get quite lost because mm. it's a big, it's like writing an orchestral piece. Yeah. It's, and you've got to keep all the different um, harmonies and different instruments and different parts in your head. Mm. And you can get a little bit lost in the middle. So, But if you've got your plan, you can look back and think, no, that's where I am. That's where I'm headed. Keep the narrative drive because the narrative drives so mm. important. Mm. You don't want a reader to be, you can't let them get bored because there's too many alternatives now. You know, now yes. you've got Netflix and, every, and, everything, and everything else. You really have to earn their, their attention because people's mm. fans are got much shorter mm. you know, because they've got Instagram and Twitter and they've got so many other things they could be doing. So you have to keep them by the short and curlies. <laughs> <laughs> so you are obviously really methodical and I see, and because you have written, you're so experienced, you've written one billion books and, <laughs> and therefore <Exactly>. some, <laughs> some of that experience comes with, you know, time. So when you, can you cast your mind back to, Maybe not quite puberty blues because that was you were so young when you wrote that. But when you got into the novel writing groove, were you that methodical then, or did you kind of learn it along the way? I learned it along the way because it also, you know, there's only so many novels you can write from your own life experience. Um, you know, then you so you have to get more inventive. Like puberty mm. blues is pretty much autobiographical. Yes. And girls Night Out, my next novel, was um, a discontinuous narrative. It was short stories that I strung together with the protagonist turning up in each other's stories. But it, was, it wasn't it was like a, um, a proper narrative arc, mm. uh, except it began with the girls' night out and ended with the girls' night out. And then the Lama Parlour, which I, I, I do love that book, but it's a bit more sprawly. So with each book, you just you learn to hone your technique, I think. Not that it gets easier. Mm. It doesn't get easier because, <laughs> you know, especially if you write comedy, it's much harder to write comedy than drama. There's many more words in the, in the English language for despair, loneliness, <laughs> than there are for joy and jubilation and, and, and happiness. Mm, mm, mm. And, I, and I, I work hard on my, not hard, sometimes they come easily, but my metaphors and my similes, I try and make them sparkle, you know. I like to hold them up to the light and see if they, they're glittering. <laughs> No, I try. I do put a lot of energy and time, but it, I also enjoy it. I mean, it's yes. If I make myself laugh, I, hope, I think, well, I might I'll only make some other people laugh as well. <laughs> you are you you are known for your you know your comic wit. You are the queen of the pun. I remember my first ever Kathy Lett pun. I think that you had started when you were very young, writing for Dolly, and. 
And I remember, you know, reading this thing. I wasn't even sure if I knew who Kathy Lett was at the time. Um, reading this thing about you being groped <laughs> by, you know, boys. And you referred to one of them or referred to some of them as Alpha Romeo Romeos. And it's just stuck in. <laughs> there you go. That's right. Oh my God. Yes, Dolly. I was writing for Dolly in my teens. Oh my God. And Lisa Wilkinson was yes. the editor. And so yes. we were friends all that time. Yes. Yeah, oh my so God. So young. Alpha Romeo Romeos. Yeah. Yes. And I thought, and I read that and I went, that is. I was it, I was just so taken by it by the cleverness that I thought that's what I want to do. Oh, how fabulous! And I ended up writing for Dolly. So, that oh, was, fantastic. You know. so you're friends with Lisa as well? No, I was post Lisa. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, so, back then, when you were at school, you know, you wrote Puberty Blues, which is such an iconic part of really Australian culture and Australian yeah. literature and Australian cinema, yeah. and now Australian television. Did you know then you wanted to be a writer? Um, I'd, I'd always written and I'd, I used to win prizes and things. I remember getting my first prize at aged eight. <laughs> and and I just love putting words to I love words. I mean, it's a bit like um, it's the Celtic in us, you know. Celtic people have a great way with language. And and I think we've got, so we've got that kind of Irish wit and love of wordplay. But mm. then we've got, it gets a bit sunbaked because Australian sense of humour is drier than an AA clinic. <laughs> I think at why we've got this lovely mix is that we're, we're, we're not pessimistic. You know, we don't think optimism is an eye disease, but we're sceptical. We've got chronic schizophrenia, mm. but we don't have an irony deficiency. So you've got this mix of, you know, optimism, irony and scepticism, which makes for a very deliciously comic concoction. And also I always think too that the reason I developed what I call my black belt and tongue foo, you know, <laughs> the, way to, the ability to give a bit of quiplash is because, you know, growing up as a surfy chick, <clears throat> these girls were so beautiful. You know, they had long blonde hair and they had blue eyes that had perfectly proportioned breasts and lovely long slender legs. And, you know, I'm a bonsai brunette whose bra cups do not runneth over. <laughs> so, you know, the only way I could get the boys to notice me was to be funny and to be loud. <laughs> so really it was just so, just all to get laid. I mean, otherwise <laughs> the Pope would be bringing me up for tips on celibacy right now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you always had this love of words and developed this humour, but then when you wrote Puberty Blues, was the intention, were you just writing it as, you know, a couple of schoolmates writing something for fun or was the intention to publish it? Uh, the, it was really, we, uh, we wrote the books, I wrote it with a friend and we really mm. wrote it for our surfy girlfriends to give them some kind of objectivity on what they were going through. And to say, you know, you are more than just a life support system to a pair of breasts. Because, mm. you, you know, at that time you didn't, you, you, when you're a teenager, and there, don't forget, we didn't have Netflix or anything. There were no programs that, we, that spoke to the way we were living. And, 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 and of course, the, the generation gap was Grand Canyon-esque at the time. Mm. Parents had no idea what we were doing. So there was no one to, from whom we could get advice. Jermaine Greer was rhyming slang for beer. In the Nobody knew who she was. They just say well, the boys would go to the pub and ask and say, "It's your, rat, it's your turn to get the germs, Jermaine Greer beer." So you know, um, but as we started to grow out of that surfy culture and realize how misogynistic it was, we started writing these stories just for our girlfriends. Mm -hmm. And then we realized that it, yeah, that we thought it it had it had literary legs. So we sent it off, the manuscript off to a lot of publishers who rejected it, the usual story. But then we saw Anne Summers wrote a piece in the, in the uh, National Times, which was a wonderful mm. newspaper then, mm. about uh, gang rape in Queensland. Um, and we thought, well, sh this, she's a wonderful feminist and she'll understand what, what, what we're talking about. Because, you know, the boys we grew up, it disproves the theory of evolution. They were vol evolved <laughs> the apes. <laughs> they were so sexist. So we sent it to her and she got it straight away. Oh. And he rang us up and said, I think these, there's, 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 
great story. This has got good, great potential. And she sent it to a small publishing house called McPhee Gribble in Melbourne. Mm. And so it was a tiny, tiny publishing house. But, because as soon as the book came out, it was notorious. Yes. It was quite a, a roller coaster ride to go from non-entity to overnight notoriety. Yeah. And my mum's only told me recently about all the hate mail she got. <gasps> she was a headmistress. You know, she was a, a very, very loved and respected headmistress of infant, infants in primary school. And she'd get um, death threats. She got guy anonymous phone calls, which was the Twitter trolling of its time. Yes. Ringing up and saying, you call yourself a teacher when you've raised a slut like that, blah, blah, blah. But she didn't tell me any of that, which was really nice of her because I would have been absolutely devastated because I'm, I'm very close to my, my family. I adore my mother and my sister. Mm. So... Um, and, to, and it, you know, even the terminology that they just slut, all those words, because at the time, and I don't think it's actually changed that much, the double mm. standards when it came to sexuality were extraordinary. You know, mm. a man who was sexually active was a love god, a Romeo, a Lothario, a spunk rat, as we say in the Shire. <laughs> <laughs> a girl, a woman with the same sexual appetites, slut, tart, tramp, mole. You know, and I don't think it's changed that much. Guys still expect you to be so virginal. The guy's like, oh, darling, darling, am I the first man to make love to you? To which the woman replies, of course. I don't know why you're asking the same silly question. <laughs> so, you know, still going for gold in the hypocrisy Olympics. <laughs> yeah. <gasps> so, yeah, it, it, anyway, it was a heady ride it was. But I also realised what a great job it is to be a writer. You know, you get to... Mm. Um, wear your jammies all day, you get to drink heavily on the job, you know, you get to have <laughs> and call it research. <laughs> and it's a portable profession. You know, I can work anywhere in the world. Yes. That's why now I spend six months of the year in London and six months here still doing all my writing. It's a lovely profession in that way. And so when you then decided to forge this career as a writer, as a novelist, and, of course, you do other things as well, as you've mentioned, what was the career, how did you plan your career in that? Did you think, oh, I want to write a book every X number of years or that sort of thing? No, I'm quite slow, actually. I do one every two years because I, I just spend time on them. I do like 10 drafts. It's not, the easier it reads on the page, the harder it is to make it look like that. It's like when you hear a wonderful opera singer and they're singing so, you know, if you hear someone singing so beautifully and so, and it just seems so effortless. The effort going into that is huge. Yeah, yeah. So I do spend a lot of time make and polish it. And I, I'm lucky, so lucky I've got three sisters. And what I do, I send them a crate of wine each <laughs> with, the, with the first draft. And I say, don't compare notes, read the book, and then send me your notes. And if they all give me the same note, mm. I take it, you know, because so I think, right. They're unanimous on that one. Yes. And they really help me. It's, it's amazing having that sounding board. So, so yeah, fantastic. I trust, so, I trust them completely and they're all really funny and they're mm. all really clever. So, yeah. And when you are, if you say that you're quite slow and you spend a lot of time in it, so just give us a bit of a timeline and let's just use this book um, as, a, as an example when you wrote this manuscript of how long it took you to do first draft and then what kind of editing period is there after with your 10 or however many drafts? <laughs> well, I, this one I wrote in lockdown, so I had a lot of much more time than I would normally have because uh, there was nothing else to do and I was writing it to amuse myself. <laughs> um, so I suppose I spent six months on the first draft and then then showed my sisters, then took all their notes, and then my editor, I've got a wonderful editor at Random House, my favourite editor so far, uh, Catherine, and she, she, her notes were also really good. If you get a great editor, that's, the, that's like winning the lottery. And I've had many editors, but Catherine's my favourite. She was so good. And then, you, then it's about, then it's the fun part because then you're just fine-tuning. Mm. Once you've got it there, the manuscript, then you're just cutting and polishing. I love that part because you're just making it better and better. That's the best. Mm. But, I, yeah, but I do want to invent this new genre because I think um, when I look back at my writing career, I think I kind of kick-started chick lit. I hate that expression mm. because, you know, a man who writes first-person first funny contemporary fiction gets compared to Chekhov, you know, and I get, <laughs> and I get Chekhov and I get a pink cover with a cupcake on it. it. drives me crazy. 
you know, at least call it, and I write, my books are quite sexy, at least call it clip bit or something. But anyway, so, but I kind of, with, with Puberty Blues, Girl Side Out, Lama Parlor, I sort of invented that genre. Mm. Um, and then I kind of invented Mummy Lit with um, Fetal Attraction and Mad Cows. Mm. Mad Cows was a huge bestseller for me in Britain. Mm. You know, and then a lot of other women started writing those kind of books. And then I wrote uh, Nip and Tuck, kind of invented Nip Lit, people <laughs> satirizing the cosmetic surgery. But I think, you know, now for women my age, I, how I said to you, I want to see characters like my friends who are just, you know, having their best time of their lives and enjoying their second act. Yes. So I was workshopping this idea with my sisters and the name we came up with was I Don't Give a Shit Lit. <laughs> it's funny. I love it. <laughs> my mum just going, you can't possibly call that. And I said, but that's how women feel because what happens to you as you age, of course, your estrogen goes down and yet your testosterone comes up. Um, so you get a little bit more bolshy, a little bit more selfish, a little bit more like a bloke basically. <laughs> and what happens with men is the opposite, that as they age, their testosterone goes down and their estrogen comes up. So the majority of divorces in Australia now are initiated by women and the two peak times is when the last child finishes school mm -hmm. and the husband retires. And one of the big problems is that, you know, we live for so long now from honeymoon to tomb can be like, you know, 70, 80 years. Yeah. That's a long time for someone to find your anecdotes interesting, right? <laughs> um, and, and, and because of this longevity and because women have HRT now, you know, which is like rocket fuel, and, and because we're financially independent, uh, women and men, want, you know, wanting these different things because of the hormonal changes. Mm. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I do think for women, life is in two acts. The trick is surviving the interval, which is the menopause, where you sweat so much it's like the Gestapo is trying to get a confession out of you. But on the other side of that, it's the best time of a woman's life. Mm. Period. No periods, no pregnancy scares. You can cut the psychological umbilical cord with the kids. Mm. You know, you've got, you say, you hopefully got some savings. You can then just go and spend and travel around the world and just put yourself first for the first time in your life. Mm. And they're the women I want to read about. That's and you don't have anything to prove. You have a lot less to prove. Yeah. Oh, yeah. When you get to that, that this oh. age, right? You know, and it's you, you're no longer in the male gaze. Like women, your whole life, we're brought up to be decorative and demure, and always, you know, you get you always feel that predatory thing that men are checking you out. How attractive are you on the track? On the you know the looksometer. Mm -hmm. But of course, even though I think women are in their sexual prime in their sixties or their sixties, as I prefer to call it, <laughs> um, you don't feel as preyed upon as you did. So, uh, some women say at this age they feel like they've got a cloak of invisibility. But I'm like, mm. Mm, shall we use that cloak for good or for evil? <laughs> 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 so yeah, it's a really interesting time of a woman's life. And I don't think you really come into your true self, into your real skin mm. until you're post-menopause and you, can, you don't have those huge domestic responsibilities that you once had, hopefully. I mean, still, mm. still looking after aged parents and sure. your fragile friends and your sick siblings and you're taking care of your kids' emotional well-being, but you still have this extra bit of space and time. I love this. I love that this is going to be, I have no doubt it's going to be a new genre. I don't give a shit bit. So have you started thinking of the next novel then in the I don't give a shit lit genre? Well, well, I've done two now. I've did HRT, Husband Replacement Therapy, yep. which I'm just turning into a film film script now, which I'm really happy with. And now I've got this Till Death or Little Light Mamie Do Us Part. And, yes, yeah, so the next, I'm, I'm starting to concoct another story now in my mind, which just stars these fabulous older women as, as um, you know, fun-loving protagonists. Uh, mm -hmm. So, you know, I am starting to concoct something, but it's a bit too early to talk about it right now. So you write uh, different things. You're turning that into husband replacement therapy into a film script. You write a column for the, the Sunday Times and you write, you know, um, article, sh much shorter length things than, than novels. So do you have to get into a particular gear, particularly to write a novel? Because it's very, very, it's so takes so long and it's such a sustained effort compared to bashing out a, uh, an article, right? Mm -hmm. So what do you do to switch gears? 
Um, I, I don't. I just write every day. I'm always writing, you know, and and I and I love writing. I mean, I do get a thrill out of in, inventing colourful language, you know, it's mm. a light. So it's not as though it's a massive chore. I mean, I have my down days when I'm, I want to impale myself on my pen, like <laughs> shit myself. I do have those days, like all writers, but you know, I I just love. I love wordplay, you know. I do mm. love it. It's not really a hor- horrifying chore. And also it's, what's lovely about writing um, short short pieces is that it's a good way to reach um, your readers. So I have a, as I have a column in the, uh, in the Sun Herald and The Age, just maybe one a month, mm, that's, yes. fun, that's funny but feminist. And it's amazing how the reach of that. People, Women come up to me on the street and say, I love that line, I love this bit. Yeah, I read that bit out to my husband. <laughs> so to me, that's like a little haiku, you know, a little humorous haiku I can put out there. Um, and hopefully then people think, oh, I, I must try, I must slip between her her covers, you know, satisfaction. Mm. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like they like little macchiatos, you know, and I and I like to I like that a literary macchiato, um, a mental macchiato. Whereas the novel is obviously a whole gourmet feast, yeah. Mm. Although on the macchiato theme, when I was in on book tour in Italy, because I'm I'm published in seventeen languages now, and I've been in book tour on book tour in many countries of the world. But in, when I was in Italy, the um, publisher, my publisher introduced me at, at a literary event and he, he got my name wrong. He called me Cafe Latte. <laughs> <laughs> a great metaphor for me because frothy on top with a kind of, you know, mental macchiato punch underneath. <laughs> so I yeah, may change it by default. <laughs> I love it. Oh, my God. All right. <clears throat> what was the most challenging thing about writing this book and what was the most enjoyable? Oh, gosh, the most challenging thing was getting all the financial stuff right because I have no no idea about money. It's a bit like um, women, feminists used to make a joke about why are women so bad at math because we're always being told that, that that's 10 inches. <laughs> but I, I, that side of my brain doesn't work <laughs> because when you're writing a novel, you have to do research thing, and hopefully it extends your, your brain power. That was the hardest thing. The best thing was the dialogue between the women. Yeah, so, so good. Fun. I wanted it to be like the Wimbledon of wit, you know, with yeah. bouncing back and forth, and 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 I and I just loved that. That made me laugh and gave me and kept me busy in two years of on and off lockdown in London. Yes. Um, <laughs> so you crack yourself up sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> Is that a bad thing to say? No, <laughs> not at all. <laughs> Love bites on my mirror. It sounds like I've got elephantitis of the ego. I mean, (gasps) occasionally I write something and I think, and I do make myself laugh. I shouldn't say that. But also, when the world is normal and and I'd be at a dinner party, because I I love love people, I find people really energizing. So, and and so it's an odd career choice for me to be a writer because you spend so much time on your own. Mm -hmm. I do go out nearly every night, you know, and, 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 and I, I, I like that balance. But if I'm out somewhere and I say and I just say something spontaneous that that people laugh at, I do think, oh, I must write that down. And yeah. do you? Because because I'd forget. Yeah, you've got to write it down straight away, especially if you're drinking. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay. But I never take from friends unless they give. I always say, do you mind if I if I ha- use that line? I wouldn't take without asking. Right. Especially if they tell you an anecdote. I would never. Yeah. Take, you don't. We don't do that. That's not allowed. So fantastic. Yeah, Otherwise, you'll lose all your friends. Yes, and um, uh, and finally, what uh, we always end with? What are your top three tips for aspiring writers who would love to be in a position where you are one day? So, what are your top oh, three tips? Okay, right. Well, my first tip is um, don't write with a with a, a host of literary critics looking over your shoulder. Right. Don't when you're writing, don't think about being criticized or judged. Write it as though you're just writing it for your best friend. Right. And just let it pour out. And don't be intimidated by education. I mean, because I mean I left school at 16. I always joke that the only examination I've ever passed is my cervical smear test. <laughs> but it's true. I mean, my entire education is reading. 
So, you know, I, I used to hoover the oeuvre of various authors and I remember doing, and in fact, I remember reading Hemingway while writing Puberty Blues, which I can now see is why all the sentences are short and pithy. There's no adjectives, there's no adverbs. It's very lean, mm -hmm. you know, and then I was reading Somerset Mom and then I was reading Dickens and Jane Austen and, and during lockdown, I've caught up on all the, all the authors I, I should have read. I've read, I adore George Eliot now, and I'm obsessed with War and Peace. Tol mm -hmm. I even read War and Peace. I mean, hello. Wow. <laughs> genius. They're my two top genius authors. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, don't be intimidated that, if, that you don't have a degree in literature or anything like that. The, the only thing you need to be a writer is you've got to have something to say and an original way of saying it. That's mm -hmm. basically it. Mm -hmm. and, and the other top tip I would say is it's great revenge because you can always impale an enemy on the end of your pen. You know, they say <laughs> poetic justice is, is, I think poetic justice is the best justice in the world. And I say that having been married to a lawyer for 28 years, you know, you can, it, it just feels great to shish, shish kebab some people. <laughs> That makes me sound like the most horrible human. But, yeah, why do you write, Kathy? Revenge. But, yeah. <laughs> I absolutely <laughs> love it. I have ne comically kneecapped quite a few misogynists in my books and, and yeah, they bloody deserved it too. <laughs> Fantastic. Okay, well, congratulations on your book, Till yeah. Death or A Little Light Maiming Do Us Part. Absolutely fantastic read. Oh, and um, everyone should go get a copy. Thank you so much for your time today, Kathy. Oh, it was lovely to talk to another Shire girl. Yes. <laughs> yes. I have to finish with a Shire comment. Rack Ooh. off, fish face bowl. <laughs> Perfect.